Now, one topic I talked about sort of on this sort of theme last year when we had a group come, a uh, group of young people come hear us, involves the so-called robber barons. And I'll just say a brief thing about them. The robber barons are the industrialists of the 19th century who were, I mean, these really are the guys with the white mustaches and the sacks of money. And again, the impression you get in your textbooks is that you know, these are, these are terrible exploiters who took advantage of the consumer and they could just charge whatever they wanted because they were the terrible monopolists and they got fat off of uh, the backs of good, decent people and all the rest of it. Okay, now it's true, there were some bad industrialists in the same way there are bad dentists, bad bookbinders. I mean, sure, no, no argument there. But we can distinguish between people who were bad businessmen who used the government in order to cripple their competitors. We can say, yeah, boo hiss to them. But on the other hand, there were entrepreneurs who got to where they were because they produced something people wanted really inexpensively. So kerosene goes down in price 90% thanks to Rockefeller, which means people can afford to stay up late at night instead of having to go to bed because they can't see a thing. Because they can't afford whale oil. Yeah, whale oil. You can imagine how cheap that would be, right? <laughs> whale oil. That's what they had to use. You don't have to use whale oil anymore. You can get inexpensive kerosene. Now, why is this bad? Why am I supposed to hate these people? Or Andrew Carnegie. Okay, the price of steel rails, basically under Carnegie's efforts, thanks to his efforts, uh, decreases by 90%. And that is going to ripple through the whole economy because everything either has steel in it or uses steel in one way or another in the production process. So he can make everything, in effect, less expensive to produce and use and acquire. There's n government can never do that. It can take some money from you by force, you know, with a gun and hand it to your neighbor. Big deal, right? I mean, any, any one of us could do that. But very, very few people have the organizational and uh, technological knowledge and ability to do what these people did. Or another one is, is uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. And the difference between Vanderbilt and the others is that Carnegie and Rockefeller and some of these others were known for their philanthropy. I mean, they're just giving away money at the end of their lives. They're just throwing it at anything. You know, you, you, you've got a pulse, here's a million bucks. They're just throwing it at everybody. Vanderbilt wasn't that way. He put up the seed money for Vanderbilt University, but then basically he just decided to keep the money. But all the same, if you look at his career, it's, it, it starts off in the steamboat industry, and that's what I'll basically talk about. But later on, he got into railroads and other stuff. But Robert Livingston and Robert Fulton had been granted by New York a monopoly of, of steam, steamboat traffic. And Vanderbilt was hired, in effect, to, to run a steamboat in defiance of this monopoly. He's going to transport people uh, between New Jersey and Manhattan, even though technically he's not allowed to. And he managed to evade capture and to, to charge only one quarter of what these monopolists were charging. Well, eventually the steamboat monopoly was overturned, so Vanderbilt can sort of legitimately get into the business. So thanks to his efficiency, <coughs> travelers going from New Brunswick to Manhattan were now paying six cents per trip instead of several dollars. They're paying six cents per trip. Um, they ate for free. Look, here's free. just come on board. I'll give you like a hot dog or whatever. I, I don't know if they had hot dogs then, or they would probably be even more disgusting, disgustingly produced than they are now. But, but trips are going from several dollars to a few cents consistently. Uh, on, on one of his routes, he dropped the fare entirely. So you could travel for free, and he just hoped maybe you'd buy some of his food. Now, even when, he, even when he's dealing with competitors who are getting government assistance, he still beats them. So Edward Collins gets a grant from the government of $858,000 a year to provide mail delivery across the Atlantic. Well, Cornelius Vanderbilt is getting a big fat zero from the government, and yet he enters the field, he outperforms Collins in passenger travel and in mail delivery, and he does so with no subsidy at all. Congress eventually did away with this subsidy to Edward Collins, and uh, Collins wound up going bankrupt. Meanwhile, Vanderbilt is also outperforming two steamship lines that are also subsidized that are bringing passengers and mail to California, and they're charging $600 per passenger uh, per trip. Vanderbilt, with no subsidy, charges $150 per passenger and delivers the mail for free. 
Now, at that time, of course, as today, people are envious of those who have more than they do. And so their, their complaints, oh, you know, Vanderbilt, what a crumb. And so Edward Atkinson, who was a, a famous Boston manufacturer at the time, tried to put Vanderbilt's achievement in perspective here. He, he said to people, he said, okay, Vanderbilt is making um, 14 cents profit on every, ba every barrel of flour shipped by his, uh, his railroads. Eventually, uh, Vanderbilt, as, as I said, moved into railroad, uh, the railroad business. But Atkinson goes on to say, but at the same time, okay, sure, he's making 14 cents uh, per barrel, but you're saving, thanks to him, $2.75 a barrel. Like, wh isn't that enough? Like, what more does this guy have to do? Does he have to hold your hand and, to, you know, take you to the playground? Like, wh wh like, what more does this guy have to do for you, right, for, for you to get off his case? So, I, in other words, this is worth thinking about, right, that, that maybe what we hear about these people in our history books might not be might not be taking all factors into account. And I've also pointed out that my friend Tom DiLorenzo has done some interesting research on this. He looked at all the 19th century industries, late 19th century industries, where people were saying, this industry is monopolized by one firm or a few firms, and it's terrible, and, and they're, they're raising prices and lowering their output. And he went and looked at them. He said, well, why don't we look and check, right? The numbers are sitting right here. Why don't we just look? And he found that actually, the firms that were accused, or the, pardon me, the industries that were, there was, the accusation of monopoly hovered over their heads, were the firms where output was increasing the fastest in the economy and where prices were going down the fastest in the economy. So, in other words, almost everything we're told about this is completely 100% a lie. I mean, and, and all you have to do is just look at the numbers. I'm not making this stuff up. You can just go, go check it yourselves.